I will start with introducing my speakers here, which are today here with us. And also, I encourage you all to participate as much as you want during the discussion, because we would really like uh, of this to be like an interactive conversation where we can share and exchange our experiences or thoughts on maybe some useful solutions that I, uh, the ideas, basically, of the problem that is more or less present in, in, in the world in general and in different countries, but maybe in the CE it has some kind of different, let's say, manifestations and it functions in a different way. So today with me uh, we have Andrei Petrovsky from Share Foundation, uh, Peter Erdeli from 444, Hungar Hungarian media from Hungary, and Domagoj Zovak from the satirical TV show Primetime in, in Croatia. Okay, so basically uh, now uh, for this, like, introductory part, I would ask you just to give us some kind of, imagine that we don't know anything because I, I, I don't know actually how much uh, any of you knows about the state of journalism and the state of, let's say, civil rights defenders and the conditions in which they work in, in the countries in the southeastern Europe. So I would ask you maybe to share a few things about the work you do and maybe something more about the region or a country that wh where you actually do your work. First of all, hello everyone. Thank you for having us in Brussels. It's nice to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, well, what what Share does uh, for five years now is uh, monitoring of digital rights violations, primarily in Serbia. But since June of this year, thanks to a project supported by Civitatis, uh, together with Bern, uh, we are monitoring the state of digital rights or digital rights violations in the region six countries, uh, three EU, three non-EU, uh, meaning Serbia, North Macedonia, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Romania, and Hungary, all interesting countries. So what we are trying to do is try to map out the biggest uh, digital rights violations um, cases in, in these countries, thus trying to plot some sort of trends and see um, what is the general um, let's say, um, relationship between the government and uh, the other sectors that you mentioned, mainly media and, and activists. Uh, what we have documented until now, uh, it's over 600 cases in Serbia, 700 cases in, uh, in uh, additional 100 in these countries. Uh, I mean, that's logical because it's a much shorter period of, of time. But in six months, we got 100 cases from the region of the Western Balkans, which I think is quite quite impressive, uh, not necessarily in a good way. Um, we see some similarities, but we also see some, some differences, not necessarily uh, depending on whether the country is a member of the EU or not. So we do have countries um, who are members of the EU, like some of the present on, on this panel, who have basically similar treatment for digital rights as other countries who are not members of the EU of the EU. What we can see as a trend in Serbia, and I think that would uh, reflect on the region as well, is that the types of attacks and the types of violations of digital rights have changed. While in 2014, when, when we started uh, the, the monitoring process, we were mostly getting um, more technical attacks like DDoS and other types of uh, purely technical attacks. Now we see more, let's say, social engineering or other types of uh, pressure, including threats and, 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 I mean, you know, best smear campaigns, etc., that happen in the public space. A new emerging issue that's been coming up in, uh, let's say, the past year and a half to two years, and that's where our friends from Edri have helped a lot, is the relationship with big platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc., which are in many cases unapproachable for m small media outlets from the Western Balkans and uh, even more for independent activists. So that, that is an issue that we're actually mapping out at this moment as, as something big. Thank you, uh, thank you Andre. Uh, now I think that we can switch to Peter, who can give us uh, like a short overview of what is going on in Hungary and how, with, how is it to be like a journalist in this context at this moment in Hungary. Okay. Hi, so my name is Peter Erde. I'm a senior editor and director of 444.hu. We are an online only website. We began seven years ago, almost seven years ago. We reach about 400,000 people a day and about three million a month. 
we are only in Hungarian and we cover politics and current affairs and silly stuff and everything. Uh, so I think in Hungary there's a lot of talk, I think even internationally, about problematic policies of the Hungarian government. I think of all the sectors they are trying to change to their liking, I think their media policies are probably one of the most problematic ones. Uh, there's, uh, I think, a, a, a true pr too prone approach to how they want to achieve more influence and, uh, you know, more visibility for their ideas and less visibility for, uh, for anyone else's ideas. One would be to make life uh, increasingly difficult to independent uh, news, news outlets and journalists, both in a systemic level and personally. And on the other hand, they prop up media outlets which are uh, sympathetic to their cause, and they do this by funneling extreme amounts of public money to them, uh, both through advertising and direct government subsidies. And so this was an evolution over the past uh, 10 years. So this is not static, and I don't think we, that we reached the end point yet. I, I'm not even sure there is an end point ever. This is not in the nature of these things. But by now, the landscape looks like there are still a few outlets with varying uh, levels of independence. We are the most independent, by the way. You heard it here. <laughs> and then... Uh, How do you measure your independence? In Hungary, in Hungary I mean. Oh, it's uh, my opinion, sorry. <laughs> I should have began with that. Um, so, so there are still independent media in Hungary. There are critical articles and videos about the government. There's uncovering corruption. There's still good journalistic work going on. But the space for that is decreasing. And I think the government is really careful or really conscious about which outlet reaches which audience. So for example, their voter base tends to live outside of the capital city. So over the past four years, for example, they bought up every regional newspaper and every regional television station and every single regional radio station because they did polls. They, they, they hired pollsters to look at what their supporters are reading and listening and watching. And when they had the results, they went ahead and systematically bought those outlets up. So the, uh, my site, which, uh, which reaches people mainly in the capital city and other population centers in the country, even though 400,000 people is a lot, it's not, politically speaking, is not necessarily a threat or not a, as big a threat as maybe a smaller outlet with a different demographic. And so, I think this is part of their policy. And then there's a lot of attacks on independent media. Again, these are smear is incredibly prevalent. Uh, in Hungary, the whole pro-government media machine sort of, you know, daily attacks individual journalists and calls them whatever stupid and treacherous and a foreign agent and that sort of stuff. And then over the past eight months, we got an increasing amount of threats. These are emails and chat messages and stuff like that. And that's obviously a varying thing. And I think this should be enough for now. And then we can elaborate. Or Yes, no, it's fine. Thank you, Peter. And you mentioned one very important perspective, which I would like uh, of all of us to refer more on that during this panel. It's the, besides the challenges and the different types of smear campaigns that journalists are faced with, there are still people who are doing an amazing job regardless of all this, like, let's say, bad circumstances. And I would also like of us, like, during this panel to refer on this, how they do their job and maybe to share some kind of, I don't know, interesting practices that can be implemented in, in different states that have the similar challenges. And now I, I, I would uh, like Domagoj to say something because he's, uh, actually, he's involved in a type of journalism that is slightly different than the type of journalism that Peter is in, which is like a satirical TV show called Prime Time, and it's very popular in Croatia. It's broadcasting on N1 television, and maybe you can tell us something more about the work that you do, and the state in Croatia in general. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Domagoj. 
so uh, yes, I'm I'm kind of really different than than, than Peter, and and uh, I'm I'm kind no 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 I'm I'm kind of embarrassed because I just crack jokes and and do stuff like that. But there is always uh, you know a lot of truth in in whatever I do, uh, and I talk a lot about uh, current affairs and everything through jokes, you know, and everything that's happened in Croatia. But you and can be arrested in Croatia because of the jokes. Yeah, we yeah. saw that, yeah, that this that autumn. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But uh, journalism in general in Croatia, well, I mean, my prime minister is, is a couple of kilometers from here, so he would say that everything is great in Croatia, especially in media. I mean, things are uh, better today in 2020 than I guess in 2018 uh, because one thing changed and that's uh, the influence of this big company that uh, used to, it, it was state in a state, it's called Agrocor mm -hmm. and they were the most uh, powerful company in Croatia. Uh, they were really close with this government and, and the last government, every single government in, in, his, in the history of Croatia. Uh, the boss of the company used to finance campaigns of both uh, big parties, so so he he never went into any arguments with them, and they didn't went into any arguments uh, with him. And uh, his influence was really really big in, in Croatia. Like uh, whoever wanted to write or report anything about Ivica Todorić and, and uh, Agrokor would get uh, himself and his media into trouble. And it, it was kind of economical pressure was put on them because he was so, so Agrocor was so powerful because they are, you know, like, uh, they are uh, holding lots of stores, they are uh, selling fuel, they are, you know, like th there isn't a thing in, in, in Croatia that you couldn't buy from them. It was a mobile network, e everything, bank services. You could do anything with them. So they were extremely powerful, and if you if you went against them, you would you would be blacklisted, you know. Like and 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 blacklisting was not that just that Agrocor wouldn't advertise with you or 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 do uh, stuff with you. They would blackmail uh, the other companies if in Croatia that if they work with you, uh, they then they won't work with you. So I don't know if you want to sell something in in. Uh, Konzum. Konzum is uh, a big uh, store in, in, in Croatia that Agrocor holds. And uh, if you talk anything again, if you, if you, if you advertise your uh, product uh, on that website that writes against Agrocor, I mean not against, but about Agrocor, then uh, your product won't be sold in, 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 in Konzum. So the pressure was economical. And luckily, I mean, luckily, I guess not luckily for, for some workers in Croatia, but luckily for the media freedom in Croatia, uh, Agrocor kind of fell apart uh, last two years, and uh, it doesn't have that much influence on politics and everything, although the, this, this whole thing with, with falling apart of, of uh, Agrocor was another uh, scandal in Croatia that uh, thanks to a working journalist in Croatia, we kind of find out about how the whole falling apart of uh, Agrocor was just an uh, opportunity for the people that are close to the government and the ruling party to acquire some money from, the sel from themselves and to uh, tell to the rest of us, well, it, it, it was a rescue operation, you know, people would lose jobs and everything. So I guess if we, you know, like earned a couple hundred million euros, well, you know, it was for the good of everyone. So you should be all be thankful. And, uh, but the other thing that still remains the same and it's getting worse if this economical pressure from Agrocor went away is the um, uh, charges, you know, like uh, people are uh, suing journalists all the time, you know, and everyone is getting um, psychological pain, you know, they, they want to retribution for their psychological pain, you know, there, there are a lot of people in Croatia that have a lot of psychological pain, and it's always that, you know, like politicians, judges, they are all suing journalists, and they want money for their psychological pain. So, which is kind of funny, because there wasn't, uh, on any of those trials, 
there wasn't any uh, psychiatrist that, that will uh, measure that pain, you know, to tell us, well, it's uh, this kind of pain and that worth this much money because, you know, I it's crazy. Uh, we, as a, a satirist, we were sued uh, from a, a certain uh, right-wing uh, TV host that is notorious for, for his views and, and here is his smirk campaigns and, 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 and... And what have you done? What? What have you done? Well, I wrote an article that, that was uh, joking about uh, his uh, Nazi and, and uh, drug abuse and hooker abuse past. And I make this funny article about him and he sued us. And we lost that also for his psychological pain because the judge said that uh, satire uh, must be true. Like, you have to uh, write satire that is truthful because. I mean, it's kind of confusing, but I don't know a single joke that is true. I mean, the point of joke is that it isn't really true, but it's kind of true, but, but it's not really true. So it's, it's impossible true. to do. So I guess the, the, the current problem, there is some uh, uh, political pressure, but it's, it's mostly today uh, ru uh, rulings of Croatian courts. You know, that, that's the big, biggest problem of, of Croatian journalists today. Okay, I think that you, uh, uh, that also takes us to another important segment, which is <coughs> something that I read. I think that someone from 444 gave an interview from for Al Jazeera in 2018, and there was a sentence which is like pretty general, that is like uh, that the public media are conquered by the government, by the government in general. I think that that is something that basically is something that can be applied both to Serbia, to Hungary, or to Croatia. but. Is it the same? Is it the same? And also, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you use digital space? Do you see it as an alter alternative, basically, if the public media, let's say, are completely pro-government, influenced, and whatever? Do you then, like, uh, have your work in the digital environment as 444, or probably your TV show is mostly viewed on YouTube? This, yes, probably. And uh, Andre, on the other hand, share monitors the state of digital digital rights in Serbia. So, uh, what challenges this kind of exposures brings to you? Does that mean that you are safe from any kind of the attacks? That what are the possible, let's say, successful methods to uh, have your message uh, to, to have to have your message? as true as possible and uh, transferred to the public and to your audience. Can I start? Okay. So in a set where you have a shrinking mainstream, meaning that uh, most things that are not in line with what the government's saying uh, are not streamed on media, uh, traditional media with national frequency or won't be printed in millions of copies in terms of newspapers, uh, the internet is definitely a space that's much freer uh, of pressure. But also the internet is a space where there is a lot of inaccurate information, where other types of information are information is streamed, uh, alternative facts, misinformation, disinformation, etc. So even though on one side the internet did open up a space for things that are not mainstream um, and did give an opportunity to media that are not uh, that do not have access to uh, national frequency or do not have um, the funds to work as um, I don't know, newspaper or something to be uh, more oriented towards the, the, the digital audience, which does work to some extent, but um, it's still, I wouldn't say, is, is mainstream. The, the, most of the people in Serbia still do get their information through traditional media. Um, and until uh, that I've, I think it's a question of age to, to one extent. The younger generation obviously um, goes to the internet for information. The older generations go to, to more to traditional media. And until we have a different balance between those two groups, we, 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 we uh, won't have a major change. What's really interesting is that both, um, let's say, uh, pro-left or left-oriented, but also right and far-right do exploit the, the internet on not only the terms of, of media outlets, but also when it comes to social media. Uh, for example, uh, Vojislav Šešelj, who is a former 
hug that knee, uh, he was in the Hague uh, process. Once he came back, basically his Twitter exploded, meaning that the internet is a space, but it's space for various groups. It's not only truth and uh, objective journalism on the internet. That's what we have to have in mind. When it comes to uh, the, the proneness or the openness to attacks, I would say the, the, it's uh, so and so. I mean, it's quite similar to compared to journalists who work in non-digital media. Um, I'd say the treatment towards journalists is quite similar. On the other side, when it comes to the digital environment, yeah, your site, ha your website can be hacked, uh, but that is still slightly easier than your office being broken into. So. Um, it is different in that regard, but there are risks, obviously, in both in both cases. So. Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, that journalists usually also face the situation when the offices were broken. Uh, I would really like that you share also that this is something that is happening to investigative journalists in, in Serbia in general, uh, especially because when we are talking about the journalism and about these like usual suspects, you uh, also according to our digital monitoring that has been conducted in all countries, you can literally target the groups that are usually being the victims of this kind of, of the attacks. Most frequently, those are journalists and activists in general. Uh, and then on the third place, maybe we have the opposition to, to the government, like political parties and things like that. Uh, and Peter, uh, in Hungary? So, uh, for the public media, uh, I mean, I think it would be difficult for me to describe sort of the levels of bias that is displayed there, because I feel the outside of Hungary and maybe uh, some of the really bad parts of the world, there's little reference to how they manage things. I can tell you some ridiculous examples, slightly amusing ones. Um, so the Hungarian government policy on migration is not very nuanced, as you might know. Uh, migration is bad, that's pretty much the, the message. And uh, since the public media, and I know terminology may or may not be important, but it's not, it's really state media, it's not public media. But the goal of the state media is to support the government's uh, political you know, aim. And therefore, they look for stories with, uh, with problems of migration. And uh, migration it can be problematic, and there are interesting and worthwhile stories to tell about that. But uh, since the atmosphere is really, uh, it, it, it evolved into this hyper craze, and this happened, I think, last year. So one of the German satirical sites had a story saying the, the town of Essen, which means to eat, I guess. I'm not good with German. was uh, renamed uh, Fassen, uh, to, to, to fast, to starve, because of Ramadan. This was a satirical, this was a joke in the German media uh, in relation to, uh, to migration, I guess, and Islam. Uh, so the Hungarian public media carried this, this was on the nightly news, but this as, so this was truth, this was their reality. The, the presenter with a grave face said, we have some you know, worrying news for Germany, from Germany. The town of Essen was just renamed Fasen because of Ramadan. And like, again, this is amusing, but this is, I mean, I admit it is amusing. But, uh, but on the other hand, this is the reality for many people. Uh, you know, I think in Hungary, but I'm, this is true for many other countries, people fall into categories that, you know, have awareness of the world. And I'm not, I'm not saying, like, I'm not blaming the people who live in the countryside and don't speak English and travel to Essen or Berlin or Paris. So they don't have a first-hand experience about these things. So they see the TV, we can debate the quality of public television, for the past whatever decade, but for a long time it was, you know, fair coverage of what was happening. And then, without anyone telling them, this suddenly changed. And then the TV started telling them not just lies, but these completely ridiculous notions of reality. But no one told them, and how would they know? They don't go to, they don't go to Germany, and they are not, they are not in tune with what these realities. And it's not their fault. 
but I think it shows how much power, reality wrapping power the public media has in Hungary. And this is true for other uh, media outlets too. I think it's important to say that in Hungary, I'm not aware of anything physical. So this stays in the digital space. And when I say digital yeah. space, I <coughs> include smear campaigns on television too. But there's, I'm not aware that anyone had their home broken into, that anyone was threatened in person. Uh, that thankfully doesn't happen. I'm not like, again, there's like a worrying evolution there, so it might eventually happen, but not right now. And I think the government applies some of the autocratic uh, sort of measures or policies in like a, as needed. So they don't, they are careful not to crack down more than it's absolutely necessary because, you know, they, for keeping up appearances, they really like this illusion. We are a member of the NATO and the EU. They're, you know, they, uh, they really pride themselves on Hungary being like a, a democratic country. So there's a lot of effort going into that. And so they only do, again, undemocratic things or problematic things where they feel that's, need to, that's needed to, uh, to, to, to keep their power, keep their money, and keep their influence over the public discourse. Is that? Yes, yes. okay, Peter. Uh, and Domagoj, uh, uh, Peter said something about the democratic country and democracies in general. For example, uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with the regional context of Western Balkans, but for example, in Western Balkans, even though we look at Croatia, okay, when Kolinda was a president, that there is some, there are some really serious issues of discriminations towards people based on nationality, I don't know, glorifying the Stasha movement and things like that, but still, everyone is claiming that Croatia is the only functional democracy in the region. Like, even though, even though we can disagree on the results of the elections, but the democracy works in Croatia. What yeah. do you think from your satirical <laughs> point of view? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the, well, when you, when you, when you uh, put the bar really low, then anything <laughs> about that looks uh, amazing. And, and when I'm listening to, to my colleagues, um, especially in the, in the way uh, public television works, uh, I have a certain bias against our Croatian radio television uh, because we used to have a show there and uh, then the government changed and then they just kicked us out, you know. They, they, they accused us that we are spreading uh, anti-Semitism, which was crazy, you know, but, you know, they, they just wanted s something because I, I, I did a bit about anti-Semitism and, and uh, hold this right-wing madness in Croatia that goes against Serbs and everything. And uh, I dress up like uh, Ustasha and uh, I was walking uh, through Zagreb and asking questions to people like, will Jews destroy the world? And, and they were like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're really gonna destroy the world. And after that, I talked with, um, uh, with the um, president of a Jewish community in, in Croatia and he was part of the, I mean, I showed him the whole thing. He gets the joke. I was dressed up like his fashion and I was talking to him, you know. It was, you know, it, the whole point of the bit was to joke against those people, uh, those Ustasha people, right wing and everyone. And uh, they use it uh, to kick us off the television to say that we are spreading anti semitism which is, which is crazy, you know. And uh, today, I mean, I can't say that things are, uh, 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 bad on Croatian radio television that, that it's spreading propaganda. That, that's not the truth. They just uh, kind of gave up. Their, their main news are not provocative. They're just boring, you know. When you watch uh, uh, Central News I in, in uh, 7 or 7.30, when, when does it go? Because I don't know, because no one watches that on Croatian radio television. It's boring, you know. The, the, they never ask provocative questions, you know, they always cut that the thing because when uh, someone comes out, uh, like prime minister and the journalists around them, it's only a journalist from uh, uh, those private televisions like Nova TV and uh, RTL and also N1 that asking the hard questions, you know, like 
journalists from uh, uh, Croatian radio television, they just hold the mics, you know, there are no questions, you know, just, they're take, just taking statements. So I, ca I can't say that it's propaganda, but it's, it's, it's just giving up on, 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 uh, uh, on being provocative, you know, to, to, but not the whole television, you know, there are still pockets of, of, of great stuff, you know, great shows, great uh, uh, investigative uh, magazines and, and stuff like that, that there is still working that on Croatian radio television. But, you know, like, that's not the way to succeed there. If you're not provocative, it will, it will be uh, much better for you, you know, for your uh, person, personal, uh, for your personal uh, achievements to not to be provocative on Croatian radio television. So uh, I guess all the all the best uh, TV uh, journalists went to N1, you know, because N1 is currently the place of of the biggest freedom for for journalists. There is no economical pressure, there's no political pressure, and they really work the uh, the best job there. You know, I, I mean, it's not because I work on for N1. I know now I'm biased, but. Uh, I, I know all those people. They 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 used to work on on on, on Croatian radio television. They used to work on Nova TV. They used to work on RTL. So something was wrong on all those uh, 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 stations when they went for for N1. And I know N1. Uh, I I don't know how much money they can gi give those, but uh, but, I, uh, but I know it's not about the money. It's about the freedom to to do your work, to do your journalistic work, and that's that's the great thing about N1. So. When I work my show, I know that I'm gonna uh, have the best uh, questions that were asked. I will have the best clips. Their 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 uh, cameras, their their journalists, are always at the right place with the right right stuff. So so they they make my job easier. Okay, I think that uh, yeah, of course. Uh, just one thing about so how proper. And I heard you saying. Uh, your problem with the with, this, uh, with your public media that they are not asking uh, in, like exciting questions. I think that must be like heaven. It's like a, a utopia. Like uh, I just can't imagine that. And one more thing, I think this. I mean, how propaganda works at least in Hungary has uh, this psychological element to it. So the producing of it. So what happens is the government is is not omnipotent. They don't control every single reporter and TV show. They don't like tell everyone what to do. So there's like a general direction they expect and I'm sure they communicate that to the leaders of certain media companies. And then what happens, so there are, let's say an article which is sort of ordered by the government, maybe not the exact wording, some of the wording too, but uh, you know, they want to see a piece about whatever, an opposition MP, or there's like a concentrated effort to smear someone. And then what happens is someone publishes that piece and within that organization, and that's just another newsroom, I mean, we can debate whether those people are journalists or not, but it's still, it's a community, it's a group of people there. And so they will see that someone wrote a hit piece about, uh, an independent journalist or an opposition politician, and they will get praise for it. They will say, good job. They will get a, you know, a better paying position and something. So the next guy thinks, even though he's not told to write some craziness, this is the way to get ahead. And therefore, he will write something similar to, not only that, but you have to like overdo the previous person because you know, that's been done. So if you want to get ahead, if you want to get noticed within this ecosystem, you'll have to write something crazier. And then a third person comes along, and these are big organizations with a lot of people in them, and that catalyzes this whole thing. And this is where it gets to Essen and Fassen being taken seriously and some of the crazier stuff. No one's telling these people, but to do this, rather, this community sort of drives itself toward these results. And I think these are the results the government expects, but still it's not them telling to spread the craziest things, rather they say something and it's a natural evolution from there because people will wanna get ahead and this is how they can get ahead. And this is true in journalism, but this is true elsewhere when, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, do we have questions? or someone would like to say something, comment. Yep. Yep. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the talk, very interesting. Um, for a moment, it sounded to me as if um, there was the suggestion made that private media have a general advantage over public or state media in terms of them being more independent. Um, now, I'm from Germany, um, where the situation looks, looks different and the debate often goes in a different direction, where we say private media, uh, be it you know, um, uh, TV people be independent on YouTube clicks, uh, um, uh, online journalists dependent on, uh, on the clicks on the article, advertisement from Google and so on, um, that there is a big dependence on that side. So how do you balance that? How do uh, independent or private run, uh, privately run journalists in your context uh, uh, keep their independence um, uh, from this side. Thank you. Who wants to start? You start. <laughs> you said that you start. No, no, it, it's, it, 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 it's an interesting thing, you know, like uh, w w when I studied journalism, I remember when we were um, discussing uh, USA and how their media works and how PBS is uh, uh, boring television no one watches, but it, it, they have uh, great stuff, you know, that's not uh, uh, flashy and anything, but it's a good journalism. And uh, the thing is that in Croatia, I guess, uh, it's also a problem with, with private media that they are dependent on the, on the uh, advertisers. So th that was the thing that I was talking about when Agricor was in power. It was also a problem with, for private media. The only private media that uh, wage a war against Agrocor was uh, our most popular uh, website uh, called Index HR and they had really hard times uh, during that era like I mean that war went for like at least 10 years or something like that they were blacklisted no one could uh, advertise themselves there you know I mean any er, anyone who wanted to do any any big work in creation with Agrocor couldn't really uh, had to do anything with, with index. So uh, there is still that problem and we pay uh, 10 euros, everyone in Croatia pays 10 euros every, every month to that Croatian radio television, you know, to, to have their public uh, independent and, 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 and something like BBC-like uh, television, but we don't have that, you know. It's just an idea that it would be great, you know, to, to have something like that. and. Um, Last government uh, started something, uh, uh, they, they started a fund for independent media. So uh, there were certain um, things that you had to do, certain obligations and everything, and you could, you could uh, but it, it was a good thing, you know, to have independent media that, that, that I mean, I think the money went from European Union and, and it was, uh, financing this this small uh, uh, websites and they did a great uh, journalistic work you know people uh, from the private media used to hate them because yeah you're taking you know uh, public money and something like that but uh, uh, I guess the, the the conditions for that money were really strict you know and uh, people from the right were also uh, angry about them like uh, why don't we uh, get money for our websites because one of the main reasons, uh, one of the main um, conditions to get that money is uh, you don't, uh, you can't spread hate speech against minorities, uh, national minorities, gay minorities, anything like that. You can't do that, you know, and, and, uh, and the website that, is, uh, that was always talking uh, against uh, those uh, independent uh, websites, I guess their first goal is to talk against Serbs and gays and everything and they're like, why don't we get the money? I guess maybe you should read your website and then we'll, you will know why do you didn't get the money. But when the government changed, uh, they canceled that, you know, because uh, they said that those in the independent websites were just, you know, like propaganda for the former government, which I disagree. I think that the best articles against that last government uh, and, and criticizing that government came from those websites that were receiving money from that independent fund. So, so it was a great stuff, great idea, but it was canceled. And, and right now we, we can uh, just, uh, I don't know, for, for the time being, uh, private media are doing better journalistic work today, but we are all aware that they are dependent on advertisers and clicks and everything. So 
if you take index, you know, that, that is more, more most pop popular uh, site in Croatia, they're doing great investigative journalism, like really, really great. You know, you, you, they, they, uh, they are, uh, their achievements are in the heads of our ministers, you know, like they have like 10 guys in the last 10 years were, were uh, had to resign from their work because of work on Index Hire. But the price that Index pays for that to get the money are uh, there uh, oh, sometimes, you know, like they're the fastest. So if you're fast, you didn't fact check anything. So sometimes they're spread something that could go like yellow or fake news. Uh, they uh, run a lot of gossips and, you know, like tits and butts and stuff like that, you know, to finance themselves. So that's the bad side of it. And I guess, I don't know, maybe one day we'll have a BBC, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not really optimistic about that because whenever government changes, uh, every party has that need inside of themselves to, to control Croatian radio television in a way. Um, so going from small to slightly less small, in Hungary, the big, because of the level of state capture, there's no independent big business, national business, independent of the government. So if you look at the largest business people, the largest construction companies or hotel chains or stuff like that, those are controlled by people who, they are the same as the government. I mean, not nominally necessary, but they are the same. And therefore, from my perspective, it's, you know, it's the same to, to have to deal with that, but still, I think, and this is, again, just my experience, uh, Hungary, I'd still rather have the marketplace dictate some of the dynamics of journalism than the state. And this is because my experience is as a journalism. And this is not only true for journalism. I think there's a lot of debate uh, around how to regulate Facebook, for example, and how to regulate speech in general, like what's the, the best way to go about that. And then when I talk to people from Western Europe and, uh, and the US, some of them say, oh, government need to step in. And it's a foregone conclusion for them. Like it's obvious, like we need, like the EU needs to step up and set rules for Facebook because Facebook is, and I can understand that, sure. But then I think of Hungary and I think, and I admit, Facebook in Hungary can be really destructive and malign, and we cover that at great length. But when I think about, do I want the Hungarian government to be in charge of what's allowed on Facebook or what's not, I'm like, eh. So, again, I know this is not a great answer, I'm just, I'm just saying, yes, you, there's, being subject to market forces does uh, have negative impact or could have negative impact on journalism. But so far, I'd still take those negative impacts in the place of the, of the negative dynamics we have now because of government interference. And then, yes, I, and my personal view is the, the less government money, like I want, Right now, I think journalism is changing the way it's being funded. I think it's like cyclical. So now we are going back, oh, maybe people who read it should pay for it, which will have its own problems, but still. But I'm all for that. And if the government tomorrow said there's, they are not going to subsidize media in any way, not the media I read and not the media I don't read, I'd be content with that. So yeah, but it's, you know, hungry. Okay, answered plenty. I would just go to the next question. Uh -huh. um, maybe my general question would be, from your perspective, what can be done? And especially looking into the fact that, I mean, I think there's people from everywhere, but there's a lot of activists here from Brussels. So what could we, for instance, campaign for here in Brussels that would then protect people in the ground and journalists on the ground? Okay, so uh, first of all, when it comes to the independence part, maybe diversity is uh, 
one of the ways to go. So yeah, public funding through subsidies from the government is one way, but also try to diversify between advertising, state funding and other sources, maybe services that media could offer to third parties, etc., in order to maintain uh, as high level of independence as possible, or if not, independence but let's try not to be dependent from what one one source um, that's when it comes to the sustainability part when it comes to uh, attacks and pressures unfortunately uh, state regulation is not the only way to go I mean probably is not even the best way to go on the other side we had cases where the GDPR for example was used uh, against Facebook it's been used a few times now uh, Mark Zuckerberg was um, heard in the Senate, was heard uh, over in Europe as well. So we do see some development of the country, of the state, trying to meddle in, in what the private sector is doing. But until this moment, even though some time has passed, we didn't see any major, major changes. So I'm to some extent skeptical on until which scale can this state regulation actually bring to substantial change? Because as long as it's cheaper for Facebook to pay a fine than to change something, they're going to pay the fine. They even budgeted the FCC fine the year before they were actually fined. So it was a cost for them that they foresaw. So until we have such a situation in which a private company is much, much, much stronger than the regulation, then we cannot re really have a debate on, on which, which way we should take. First, we uh, as, as citizens should try to um, get out of the quantified model that's been uh, set upon us. And I know that, that this uh, sounds maybe a bit too extreme, but we are allowing ourselves to enter literally the matrix in which every hour step has been quantified. We entered the market, we accepted the game. So that's the game that's, that, that's happening around us at this moment. Um, it's really hard to get out of it. Uh, it's really hard to get out of social media. It's really hard not to use the internet for all these funny, nice things from one side. On the other, on the other side, the internet does give a lot of, a lot of opportunities. So th there are many questions. I'm, I'm sorry I cannot give a particular answer towards the future directions, but I just gave my opinion. So for us, I'd say don't, I'm not, I'm against uh, regulating speech in general, so don't campaign for that maybe. I know that's not a, and please campaign for whatever you believe in, but I don't, I'm not for regulating speech. I think there is a lot of problematic speech. There's increasing amounts of problematic speech, but I think the state regulating speech is going to be always more and more and more problematic, or again, in my experience. And what I'd be favor, I'd be in favor is, uh, I feel the European Union has a lot of rules in place, especially rules about how to do business, what, uh, sub, uh, what constitutes uh, maybe an illegal subsidy, uh, what are the antitrust regulations. And for Hungarian media, I feel like there are rules in place that because of the regime at home, like we have rules against monopolies and we have rules against illegal subsidies, but those national rules are not being enforced because the governing party already captured the institutions in charge of enforcing those rules. But that's not the case in the EU. So I'm aware there's uh, some people brought a case uh, in front of the competition commissioner, I think last year, that said some of the government subsidies that the pro-government media gets in Hungary is against the EU's competition rules. And then, but there's no movement on that. So I would, again, if, uh, I think if those rules would be enforced, we'd be in a lot better place because these operations need money. The, they are not too efficient. Like I think independent media is a lot more efficient. If you look at bank for the buck, our budget is like one seven hundredths of what the public media has and we reach a lot more people. And they need money to 
to keep this to keep the media space up and some of the money I think they get illegally not illegally in the sense that in a plastic bag they might do it too I, I don't know but illegally as in not according to EU rules that those are illegal subsidies and I think the EU should maybe do a better job at enforcing existing legislation about that again competition and uh, antitrust and uh, and things against uh, state subsidies of media and other companies well I, g I guess in Croatia uh, there are I guess simple simple solutions and I, I, I know it, they ain't gonna happen just like that um, like politicians in Croatia should move their claws from public television let it breathe for once in like never uh, that would be great uh, the second thing is uh, some kind of judiciary reform or something like that because uh, this whole thing with uh, charging uh, journalists for for uh, uh, psychological pain I it's gonna destroy uh, this last few independent media in Croatia I know this um, uh, novosti that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, publicly, fo pu publicly founded um, uh, newspaper and, and website uh, that is uh, for uh, Serbian minority in Croatia and uh, they have like uh, their uh, editor has like f five uh, around one million euros uh, 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 chargers uh, from different people for for uh, psychological pain, like million euros, it's going to destroy uh, novosti. If that if if courts rule that, I mean, it's possible that the courts will uh, uh, say that that it, that wasn't uh, psychological pain for all those uh, right wingers. But we don't know that. It's it's a pressure to, uh, to the journalists. So we need some kind of reform in that area, definitely. And I guess uh, the biggest problem with Croatia is that. We are a small country, and there are no, not a lot of Croats, uh, even less than four million now. And uh, the thing is, uh, state is, is uh, and everyone works with state. E everything is, is interconnected. And I know in our business, when uh, someone comes to us and say, you do a great job, you know, like, that show is great, you know, like, you just, you know, you just crack jokes on them. You, you do that, you do, you're great. Like, I know that, that someone who has money and big business and everything, and I ask him, okay, so, I don't know, will, will you advertise that as, uh, in our show? Like, no, like, I, I can't be seen with you, you know? Like, I really like you, but you know, I do business with state, you know, they buy my products and I, 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 I can't work with you. So, so that's the thing, you know, like, no one in Croatia wants to uh, start trouble for himself, you know, like why, why, why is our show on a regional N1 television that is founded from the international funds in, in USA? Because no one in Croatia wants to satire on their, their even private, private televisions don't want troubles like that, you know, they have reality shows, they have talent shows, you know, people are gonna watch it, but that's not gonna start trouble for them. If they have a satirical show, that could start a trouble because they will offend this politician, maybe this guy who advertised it in, uh, on their television. So uh, it, I guess that, that's the sad part, you know, that's, that's the kind of part that, that won't be uh, uh, corrected easily because like I said, we're a small country and I guess the biggest business in, in Croatia is, is government and state and, and, and money it comes from, from uh, public. So I guess that, that's the part that we can't fix just like that. Thank you. Um, I saw in the brief for this, there was going to be a discussion about uh, the propaganda database, if anyone... Uh, Wait, sorry, uh, sorry, I didn't hear... Propaganda database, keeping tabs on what your countries are doing, uh, your state countries are doing with propaganda. Um, yes. And I guess the other point was, 
Um, there's a bit of a discussion. You're talking about how the state has so much power, and I heard when you mention uh, the idea of a free market. Well, what are you doing to? Um, what are your countries going to do to protect against the inevitability of a free market wanting to consolidate uh, its media? So you could end up in a situation where private media moguls will own, like a single private media mogul might own several competing newspapers plus a television station plus multiple regional and national radio stations. Then you, they have an enormous amount of private power. So you switched from state power of a certain channel to a national private power. Uh, you will still need state protection um, against, let's say, uh, the media mogul who cannot be named getting privately upset with a piece of comedy about him and then using all of his stations to block certain journalists. And that happens elsewhere in Europe, but a, 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 it doesn't always end up with a good national response. So if you're switching from, from state power to you know the guiding hand of the of, uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, private organisations. Power, yeah. What are you going to do to protect against the future? I mean, uh, could you repeat the final part of the question? I I'm not sure I understood completely. The okay, if if you're afraid of the state, okay, what's going to happen when you want to jump into? Um, having a couple of men owning all the newspapers privately. Like they are going to have this, you're gonna have the same problems with just a different oligarch. Uh, absolutely, I mean, the, the, the thing with all these countries here is that they're quite tiny compared to most of the countries in Western Europe and quite poor in terms of market, meaning that rich people who have a lot of money, who, went, who want to make more money, would less likely invest in such economies that are not as strong. So the, the, that part of the interest is uh, a little bit uh, on that side weird, which is why it's, there is so much space for governments to interfere. For example, in Serbia, uh, they, well, they did introduce government subsidies, and they did put some um, on the first hand, like strict conditions, and then after <laughs> some time, you realize that they did make this call only for those media who are who behave well towards government. So, yeah, basically changing the private with the public, the public with the private actor, uh, in terms of the one who controls, is 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 equally bad. I mean, there are many levels of bias. We've done this piece on on. Um, information warfare, my colleague Vladan Jovet and myself, so where we tried to map out all the potential uh, layers of influence. And it, it starts on, on the most basic level of the internet infrastructure. Even on the level of internet infrastructure, ISPs, filtering, uh, throttling, etc. cetera, you, th there are points in which different actors can have some sort of influence. Then we go to the next level of internet blackouts or censorship where we have particular websites being blocked. Then the next level is the money level, which can be sourced on one side from government funding, but also from uh, private sources, because it's not always a political reason why someone doesn't like journalists. Sometimes it's more financial related, sometimes it's reputation oriented. We're not speaking about media, I mean, we are, but they're not only uh, basically uh, adversaries of people, of bad politicians. Other people don't like media as well. We're, we cannot speak of media as something that all the people in the public like and these bad politicians don't like. There, there are shades here that, 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 that interchange. Then we obviously have the investors, the politicians, etc. On the other side, we have the personal bias of people working in the media. Not all journalists are equally good. They're good, better, they're bad journalists, etc. So, um, and finally, we have the bias on the side of the information consumer. We as consumers do have our own layers and limitations, which can be become an interface, uh, uh, a point 
which can be influenced by different uh, actors. So it's a, it's a very complex system as such with many, uh, many points of failure or potential failure. And then if you had things like, I don't know, artificial intelligence regulating content on YouTube, if you had different additional, additional layers, then you get an even more complicated, complicated picture. So the question is nowadays uh, how we get informed as consumers of, of information, how we, uh, do we only read what these algorithms who are funded by some people want us, uh, do we read only what someone else wants us, us to read or we, we as media information consumers get the right to choose what, what we read and that's where the, the distance, the digital divides, the, 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 the gap between uh, reality, journalism and uh, citizens uh, grows even even larger. Uh, just want to think. So I think there are. Um, I don't have personal experience with that. We don't have a. We don't have a billion owner. We are owned by us, uh, for better or worse. Um, I think there are possible institutions, imperfect inf institutions, but there are institutions nevertheless which I think are worth exploring. I think it's worth for journalists in newsrooms to maybe unionize or form, I, again, union is one thing, or form, form uh, sort of an organized uh, community to, to be able to stand up for both their sort of labor conditions, but maybe other ideals and ethics and that sort of stuff. It's worth having like a, a carta, like a, a written statement of your values, of your ownership and stuff like that, that doesn't mean that someone with uh, bad intentions will not be able to circumvent that because they will be able to. But it will make it you know, more expensive, slightly more expensive, slightly more difficult if you have a carta where it clearly states that your ownership situation has to be transparent, then every change in that ownership situation will have to be published. There's going to be an occasion for debate and exposure. And I think that's, again, not a, a, an ultimate protection against it, but it's still a good thing. If you have some sort of organized labor within the newsroom with some rights that will, again, it's, it's not like actors with malign influence will always be able to, there's no perfect lock, though you can buy a lock for your door uh, but if, if there's enough, you know, if, if there's intent, somebody will be able to break in eventually. But you still put a lock on your door because it will make it difficult, albeit not perfect. So I think, again, these are small things, but I think most newsrooms can do those, and those will make it more costly and difficult for private type owners to exercise uh, control over the content. But again, this is just theory for me. Uh, I have no real experience. Well, uh, th the thing you said about uh, uh, media moguls and, and uh, state-owned media, uh, I wish we had a conflict like that, you know, bet between those, those powers. Because it's a funny uh, situation. Uh, it was, I don't know, a couple of years ago when our letter uh, prime minister uh, he was on a yacht with, with uh, one of the media moguls in Croatia on Adriatic Sea. And uh, so, so, so it, it, it's kind of funny, you know, I, I, I'm someone who thinks I'm kind of socialist, so, so this, this is going to be really weird for me to say, but we need a conflict. We need kind of competition between uh, state-owned uh, state media or public media and, and private media. So, so I guess uh, we never had that conflict. You know, they had the same, they have the same uh, interest and, and media moguls and, and politicians oft, uh, often have the same, same, uh, same goals. So I guess uh, if there were conflict between them, if there was some kind of competition, that would be solution, but currently now we, we don't have that uh, competition. Often, often, not always, but often, they have the same goals. And I guess the, uh, I guess the journalist, is, they should do something like he said, like unionize and uh, uh, have their uh, uh, professional 
standards very high and try try to try to organize against those things you know because uh, I guess state and, and and people with money will always have certain uh, interests that are, aren't always public interest so I guess you know we have to work for the public not just for the owners of our media I really like actually at the end how we switch the focus from from that point of who has the control to the point where control is such over some certain areas it can be like very problematic and can take us into some, let's say, regimes or ways of behaving that are not productive and that are not like uh, producing the, the rightful and fairly produced information for the general public in, in, in general, let's say. Uh, I also, uh, maybe for the end, uh, would like all of you to refer maybe uh, on something that we, uh, I, I took it uh, because I'm a moderator, uh, as a, as a wrap-up conclusion that even though like the regulations are bad because if we try to regulate something even more that doesn't necessarily mean that the attacks will decrease or that something different will happen. Then with this question of control usually there it's only a, a matter of who has it and very moment. With the big platforms we have different types of issues so still I think that after this panel, we, I, I feel like we have some kind of the agreement between the speakers that it's better that the control is uh, actually held by those platforms than by the states or by the government. <laughs> but I think that that's, that can be also measurable. But uh, also we had uh, something I think that Andre said regarding the internet and in general behavior in the digital, in the digital environment that that's still like a free space where we can do things and where it's a matter of your decision, like are you going to step into this arena or not, because it's still dependent on, on your, uh, let's say, decision. Uh, from my point of view, I really think that all these different things that we have been mentioning here show that uh, in 2020, uh, I think that it's less the matter of, of choice. Are you going to step out into the digital arena? Maybe it was in 2000, but now it definitely isn't. Like we have like very young people, activists who are using actively social networks because with all this situation with media, their message will not be transferred anywhere else from, I don't know, their own small cycle uh, in general. So I think that it's not the matter of choice. Do we want to use internet or not? Because we have kids kids that are two years old that know how to use tablet, how to play cartoons on the YouTube, that became the essential part of our lives. It doesn't necessarily mean that that has to, that that has, but that's okay. Uh, and I really want to know how, maybe some kind of tips and tricks for the future, how do you preserve and make your message bulletproof in this environment? And maybe some advices uh, uh, on what we should have on our mind when we are in this arena trying to achieve something. Uh, is it like because uh, even though if I want to, tr I don't know, write a good investigative story that can be seriously harmed if somebody hacks my networks or discovers my location or, I don't know, gets my files and things like that, or if only it's my, I don't know, privacy or something like that. So. Maybe, Andre, you can say something from that expert. Well, the first thing I'm going to say, don't give your two-year-olds tablets. Please, don't do that. That's really bad. Uh, another thing is, when it comes to the resilience now on the side of infrastructure, like, if you're a serious investigative media outlet, then you should definitely invest uh, time, effort, even some funds into building up an infrastructure that makes sense for the job that you're doing. So. Uh, you need to have at least some basic infrastructure in terms of uh, security procedures, software that you use uh, for secure communication. Um, there is a lot of, let's say, open source free solutions that can be implemented, but you know to know how to implement them. So uh, from our side, what we try to do, especially in Serbia, and I'll, I know there are a few other actors that are trying to do similar things. Uh, we, are, we are trying to coordinate our activities, like the OCCRP, for example. Um, uh, is to try to help investigative media to, to, to build their expertise or their knowledge through trainings and capacity building projects where we 
basically work together on creating on one side this uh, information security and privacy policies and on, on the other side the more technical part teach them how to use particular types of software or help them choose their um, hosting uh, provider or uh, other other like secure communication trainings etc so there, there, there should be, uh, let's say, multi-stakeholder approach in, in this regard. Tech community should work with media. Media should be more open to tech community in, 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 in that context of... Uh, journalists quite often are not really interested in technology in such a way that they would implement encryption or anything else because they think that would make their work slower. And what Domagri said at some point, sometimes it's really important to be the first. Now, if you implement all these procedures, chances that you're going to be the first are uh, slightly less likely. But um, I think that in some cases, it's really important to protect first yourself, your journalists, but then also your sources, because you also have responsibility towards other people that are brave enough to share their stories with you. You shouldn't put them additionally in the in a very unpleasant situation of their identity being um, revealed, which is a case that we had in Serbia recently. Um, that, definitely. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm serious that we, not until like two years ago, we started to pay attention to like tools available either for free or relatively cheap to make sure that our communications are secure, that we store sensitive data in a secure way to, to implement protocols. And I think uh, even though I'm not aware that, uh, that there was attempts to hack us, maybe because it already happened and they did it, you know, in a good, like, in an efficient way, or maybe it didn't happen, but nevertheless, I think those are important. Also, um, with the threats, um, so we, again, there's like an increasing amount of like violent threats we get. And we implemented protocols for that too. So now everyone in the office is required to send every sort of threatening communication and email or chat message to like a, to like a shared uh, news list or uh, mailing list. And then we forward those uh, when it's warranted, uh, according to our lawyers, to the police. Where now in Hungary, uh, the public prosecutor's office is, has no independence. Uh, or almost zero independence. And the police is in a different position, but we don't expect them to dedicate their resources uh, going after the people who threaten us. On the other hand, it's still worthwhile doing that because by that, again, you increase the cost of not doing anything. Because if something would happen to us, somebody would vandalize our office or attack one of our journalists, it would be terrible. But if we went to the police before, and they didn't do anything, it would be really costly for them. It would be, it would look like we reached out, we told them that we needed protection or people were threatening us, but even so they didn't do anything. So this, this forces, even if they, if it's, it doesn't, like it's not in their interest politically or organizationally to do those things properly, it's still worth doing it. And the other thing would be, um, and this is, uh, again, this is not a view I, I held for a long time. This is a view I'm, as a new, new for me. So a couple of weeks ago, we've been approached by uh, an organization that we did not know that they wanted to organize a debate with uh, one of our uh, better known journalists and the guy who's within the, the pro-government propaganda empire. And there was a lot of debate within the office whether we should do this or not is it good to engage or is it better not to engage is it if it the setting is these are both journalists debating journalism and we don't feel that reflects reality do we still do it or is it better not to and at the end of the day we decided let's let's do it that let's try it and i think it was it is worthwhile and i think a problem is for us or, or for me or for us at the office or maybe for people in this room, the distinction between true journalism and propaganda is obvious. You don't need 
to have it explained. You don't need to hear other people talk about it because you consume media, you have refined views on this. But for the vast majority of people, this is not the case. And especially people who, for example, Hungary, were like 10 years old when the current government took power. Now they are 20 years old and their frame of reference is skewed uh, about what, what journalism is or what you know, a proper media landscape should constitute. And I think, again, there are arguments for saying don't engage, but I think you still should. I think it's for journalists to say, oh, I know who I am, you are not a journalist, there's no debate about this, and you know, fuck off, sorry. I think that's just not, a, just not an efficient, it's not a, it's not an efficient, you're not going to persuade anyone. And I think it's, it's still possible to persuade people who just don't have a frame of reference or wasn't exposed to ideas other than they are exposed to in the whatever propaganda pro-government media. Okay, and maybe just to change for the end a little bit of the manner, Damagoy, are the jokes going to save the freedom of expression? Well, I, I, I certainly hope so and, and uh, I'm, See, the thing in Croatia, there's a joke about Croats that we're not funny. You know, it's always uh, Serbs are funny, Croats are not funny. And uh, I don't agree with that, not because I'm a Croat and I don't think that I'm funny. I still don't know why I'm doing the job that I'm doing. There are much uh, funnier people than me. But uh, the thing is, uh, we are funny people, but uh, we do it in private. We do it uh, in bars, we do it at home, we write those jokes on uh, doors of, of public toilets, you know, the, people are funny in Croatia, but they, they have this, this, this fear of expression that in public, and, and I hope that will change, you know, I hope that uh, there will be s satirical shows in Croatia on public television, on, 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 on private uh, televisions that people will watch it, because uh, we don't think that we are good or better or I don't know what, but I hope that other people will start doing that because it's good, you know, like uh, people are approaching me on the street and saying like, you're doing a great job, you know, we need that in Croatia. Like, I agree, you know, but we need that at public television, not at cable television that no one, and not no one, but you know, it's not, you know, you need to have a certain device to watch uh, cable television, so it's not like you plug a TV to antenna and you watch it. So, so it, 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 you need a certain amount of effort to watch us. And, and if you watch us on YouTube, you, you need an internet and everything. But we need it to be public, you know, it needs to be normal. It needs to be, you know, like, like everything that we, you know, saying in bars, and we're, I think we're really funny people, needs to be said on television, you know. And those politicians that I drove yesterday in a plane with, uh, there was a couple of ministers and, and uh, uh, our uh, Euro parliamentary uh, uh, members and I wrote on Twitter that, wow, I just realized there's a bunch of ministers and Euro parliament members on this plane, I hope we crash. Oh God. Uh, and, uh, and later, and later uh, I uh, quoted my tweet and said, bad news, we landed safely. And after that, uh, a member of parliament uh, came to me and said, I saw what you wrote on, on, on Twitter. I'm like, yeah, what? How could you say that? You know, what if we, we crash landed? Well, it would be the greatest joke ever written. Thanks. Okay, thank you all. I think that this would be it from us. If you, I don't know, want to talk with the speakers or whatever, you can do that. We will be here during the day. Uh, thanks for being here with us and as continue joking, maybe that can sometimes transfer your message better than anything else. Thank you.